Good evening and welcome everyone to a special audio edition of the Hit in the Turnbuckle podcast. I am the host, Adam Cousins, and I'm joined tonight by my good friend, AEW guru, my dynamite friend, Dave DMD. How are you doing this evening, Dave? Yeah, I'm great, man. I'm good. Good to see you. Go here. Yeah, <laughs> Could you hear me? Yeah, yeah exactly. To hear you, so tonight, we, we mentioned before that we was heading off to the island of extreme, and that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, and tonight we have a former ECW champion, former ECW tag team champion. He's been around in the WWE and he's now doing a podcast with our good friend who was our first guest on the Hit in a Turnbuckle podcast, Mr. Vince Russo. But we say good afternoon-ish to Just Incredible. How are you? I'm doing great, gentlemen. How are you? We're doing well. It's, uh, good, it's a bit late. It's getting dark over here now in the UK, but we're, we're, we're doing well. Thank you. Yeah, it's about 3.46 here. Uh, still a little daylight, so uh, yeah. About yeah, five hours about... difference between us. <laughs> there is, yeah. I had an NWA uh, guy come on a couple of weeks ago, and it was near midnight when I finished over here in the in the UK. So uh, we're not too bad with these late these late ones. Uh, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Justin, thanks so much for coming on. As we said, we're going to talk extreme. The first question that I have is obviously, I don't know how true this is, the storyline thing was you you moved to ECW in the trade, your WWE or WWF at the time, Aldo Montoya, um, you got moved in, a, in an exchange. My, one of my questions was how did Paul Lee or Paul, uh, Paul Heyman, as we know, love him, uh, sort of convince you or what was his vision for ECW at the time that you was moving over there? Well, what had happened was it, it was, uh, I don't know how true what you heard was, but uh, in reality, it was much, uh, it was much slower of a process. Um, what had happened was I was, uh, I was getting, I'd been Aldo Montoya for a yeah. long time, a well, long time, uh, two and a half years, but I, you know, I knew it wasn't going anywhere. Um, and I was really starting to become a good performer in the ring. I was really starting to have mm. really good matches at house shows and when given the opportunity, you know, as a performer. And I was, you know, 23, 24 years old. And uh, I knew I, I, you know, the things were popping off in the business. I knew WCW was doing well, yeah. was starting to do well, and uh, ECW was a thing. But I, I was always concerned when I heard of ECW. I kind of heard of it was the the blood and guts kind of uh, organization, mm -hmm. and I, I didn't like that stuff. I wasn't. I never done it right. Yeah. So um, I was in. Yeah, I went to Vince. And I asked for my release because Scott and Kevin, Scott Hall, Kevin Nash had just famously gone to WCW. And yep. they said, if you can get your release, because I still had another year or so in my contract, if you could get your release, uh, we'll, we'll get you a job in WCW. I said, cool. So I had a meeting with Vince at the office because I only live like a, a little less than an hour from Stanford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. I live in Connecticut. And I went over to spoke, you know, I had a meeting with Vince and uh, he didn't want to give me my release, um, but he said, we're going to send you down to USWA, which was their Memphis, the Memphis territory, yeah. to work with Lawler and kind of learn how to be a heel and then bring you up and repackage you. Because they were doing a lot of that with, you know, with Memphis and stuff at the time. Yeah. So I said, sure, you know, whatever. So uh, I went down to USWA and uh, after about six weeks of just, you know, doing the best I could, but financially I was getting crushed because I had an mm. apartment in Connecticut. I just did gotten married. Uh, to the wife who is still my wife today, over 20 something, 25 years plus, we were married, but we just gotten married. And, um, you know, I had an apartment in Connecticut, a car payment in Connecticut, and I was also paying for an apartment in Memphis and paying for a rental car in Memphis. So I was going broke, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> yeah. Vince wasn't paying me, I think he was giving me $500 a week, and that does not add up. No. And uh, Aldo Montoya didn't make a lot of money in those days, especially I was making like, <laughs> you know, between fifty-two and seventy-five thousand dollars a year, which is sure. not a lot when you're traveling and you're paying your own taxes. Yeah. So, anyways, the last day I was supposed to be in USWA and come home, um, uh, Chris Candido, Paul Heyman, Rob Van Dam, Sabu, the, and Tommy Dreamer, the ECW guys were doing that angle with Jerry Lawler. Oh yeah, and, yeah. And you remember that? And, yeah, uh, we, I, yeah. I saw that, and uh, Candido, who was Skip in uh, yes. WWE. Body you know, Donners, we, yeah. Yep, yeah, we, were, we were very good friends. And uh, he was kind of uh, in a management position in ECW at the time. And uh, he he said, you know, well, why don't you come here? And, you know, we'll, you know, I said, well, I don't know. You know I was uncertain. Um, and he kind of put the word into Paul. I spoke to Paul. Um, and after a very short while, I think it was a, maybe a month or so later, uh, I debuted um, 
in ECW, but I was never, it wasn't clean. It was a lot of not knowing what was going on as famous in ECW. Um, I wasn't promised anything. Uh, yeah. The first time I wrestled, I actually wrestled as Aldo Montoya at the Queens Elks Lodge on the wow. Friday night, you know, because I didn't have anything else to wear. And then uh, the next day in, at the uh, Philly uh, arena, um, at the ECW arena, uh, Paul had this idea for a character and just got some jean shorts and an ECW t-shirt and that became the uniform. And uh, that was the birth of Just Incredible. And uh, the first match was against Jerry Lynn, uh, oh. his debut as well. What a talent Jerry Lynn was, by the way. <laughs> mm, well, one of the best, one of the best. Very, very good. David, what, what's your first question for Justin? <laughs> Oh, Justin, um, uh, first of all, uh, how was it forming the Impact Players with Lance Storm? How did that come about? And what was it like teaming with Storm? Um, it was, I, I don't really remember how it came about, um, but it was great because um, Lance uh, was one of the, you know, one of the guys that trained me. Um, when I started in the business, uh, 1990, summer of 92, I went to Calgary, Alberta, Canada, as Lance would say, um, but I went to Calgary to train under the Hart Brothers camp. And uh, Jericho, Chris Jericho and Lance Storm had the year before previously trained at the Hart Brothers. So uh, Lance had stayed behind to kind of um, help Keith Hart uh, train the students. You know, he did most of the in-ring training. So in essence, Lance was my trainer. Um, and so when we met up again in ECW, you know, uh, I guess Paul found out about the history um, and figured uh, it would be a great idea to put two kind of different guys, um, as both aesthetically and even in the ring, because Lance was very smooth and technical. Yeah. Um, and I was a little, you know, I, I was still, I, I wanted to work like Shawn Michaels and Ric Flair, but I could do the hardcore stuff if asked. So we were just, you know, two on two opposite ends of the spectrum. But when we came together, it was quite, you know, quite brilliant, you know. And uh, it was just, I, I don't remember how it happened, but it was just awesome because we were, you know, friends. Uh, he was like one of the first people I was friends with in the wrestling business, you know. So uh, it just was perfect. Perfect storm. No yeah, one perfect. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, perfect storm. You could have used that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, there you go. There's another new name. Um, just to touch on that before, because I, I briefly, I remember you having a, a before, I think it was before the Impact player, you had a, a first blood match with Dreamer, uh, Tommy Dreamer. Yes. Um, and you just mentioned that there that you wasn't, you know, you wasn't quite sure about the whole extreme nature of it. And so how did that, how did that kind of, uh, did that kind of propel you into what was to come from ECW in, in late down the road? <clears throat> I mean, I, I guess it did. I, I, I started to realize, and I hate to, you know, I've said this many times before, uh, but I hate to take the mystique out of it. Um, but ECW was, uh, a lot of it, you know, most of it was a work. You know, uh, I guess, you know, after the Sabu and Terry Funk barbed wire thing, which was, you know, it was really a rough display. But most mm -hmm. of the time, the stuff we were doing was all very much a work. And I found that out quickly. So when I realized we were, they weren't as crazy as they looked. They just kind of had it down to where we were protecting one another, you know, because I was, believe it or not, I'd get stiff much more in the WWF back in those days than I did in ECW. Oh, really? So uh, I just became comfortable and figured out how I could make that stuff work for me in, in that uh, atmosphere. That's good. And did you, um, I'm a very easy. W. I, one of the guys that I, I really want to talk to, uh, and I believe you had a, a little a bit of a tag match with me in the past, was Shane Douglas. Oh the, yeah, yeah, the franchise. I, I want to—is he as great a wrestling mind as what I think he is? Anyway, I think so. I, I certainly do. I love Shane to death as a person, um, and I love him to death as a performer. There's a one. There's one as a pro wrestler. I hate to say performer, but that's what everybody uses nowadays. Yeah. Um, but uh, as a, as a wrestler, man, I, I remember um, we did a little angle somewhere in '98, and still, it's, I think it's one of my best matches of all time. It's not one of the more publicized matches, but it was a, it was a match where Shane Douglas, um, it was at the ECW arena, and he was I was challenging him for I think he was ready to leave for uh, WCW at the time, yeah. getting you know something like that, and um, you know I kind of was going to be the new franchise, and I wanted to just take that moniker from him or whatever. And we just had a match on one of the ECW Saturday Night shows, but mm -hmm. it was I mean God, it was a, a beautiful match. I mean. Uh, I, I mean, it's available out there somewhere, but man, go back yeah. and watch that. I mean, it was a great, great, great match. Shane is one of the best. 
You know, it's a shame he doesn't get the credit that he deserves. I mean, I always did. And he did from some people, but unfortunately, so much more when every any time he went to, uh, you know, either WCW or WWE, it was always some sort of controversy. But uh, Shane is, 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 is a great wrestler and he's got a great mind. He's a, yeah. and a great guy and a great guy. Speaking, yeah. uh, Justin, of some of your, your matches that, that people might not be aware of, I wasn't aware that you had a match with Scott Hall, one of your great friends. And yes. a lot of people say that you were like a, an honorary member of the clique or you were friends That's of the clique. That's what they say, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. How was working with Scott and how, was, how did that come about in ECW? Because I think Scott was oh, yeah. still part of WCW at the time. Um, yeah, it, um, I think he had just, it was 2000. And I think it, he had just either something happened. I don't know if he had left or something with his contract. I don't know. There was some bad blood going on. Mm. And uh, I think he was able to wrestle, but not on television. I thought, why? Well, I don't think it ever appeared on TV. Cool. Um, but it is out there for RF video and stuff. But um, It's on the network, anyways, man. It's on the WWE network. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and I was like, man, I'd love to. I was world champion at the time. And uh, we were, we did very good business at this one arena where we used to always do uh, WWF tapings. And uh, it was the Mid Hudson Civic Center in Poughkeepsie, New York. That was the, one of the famous nights where one, two, three kid in the $10,000 uh, yep. challenge, you know, where kid yes. almost killed himself on a flip. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that's the building. Anyway, so Scott and I love that building. And I was scheduled to be, we were scheduled to have a weekend there. And I just said, look, man, you know, uh, you know, why don't you come and wrestle me? And uh, he's like, you know what, I'd, I'd be honored to. So, uh, you know, he booked, uh, we booked him a flight and uh, he came in and um, he did a tag match the night before the house show, uh, which I don't remember what it was, uh, you know, something small. And then that night, uh, you know, we worked in the main event, you know, was it and possibly? It was I just wanted to, I just wanted to wrestle my buddy at that yeah. time. You know, it was, uh, he was very, uh, very big part of my career and taught me so much you know and uh, what was your what was your relationship with the click at that time because obviously as you said you ended up in ecw if it wasn't for uh you having a year left on your contract your career could have gone in a very different direction perhaps uh, you sure. could have been in wcw and the nwo so what was it like you know being able to have that match and that interaction with one of your close friends in the business oh, it was great you know it was great because I, well, I was always i was also proud proud of myself because mm -hmm. you know here we are uh wrestling is, is still very very big in 2000 uh yeah. ecw was doing great business you know we were selling out three three thousand four hundred or three thousand four thousand five thousand seat arenas um you know in big markets um so i was the world champion which means i mean it's not the real it's not a real title but to me it represents you're at the top of the business you Absolutely. know one of the tops and you're representing you know, one of the big companies in, in the world, right? Yeah. So I was yeah. proud of that. And I just wanted to show my friend how far I had come. So, yeah. you know, if uh, if things, I mean, things could have all gone, uh, you know, very differently for for a lot of us. But I think it was the right uh, right place for me to be and to grow, you know, at that time. I just think it was, it was a shame how it, uh, how it all ended so quickly. Well, you were, but, uh, you were so you recognizable know, as like an ECW original, like with the guys you mentioned earlier, Rob Van Dam, Sabu, you know, just incredible, particularly for us in the UK, because it wasn't as easy to watch ECW. Uh, sure. I, know, I know at times you had a television deal and, and in between like switching different networks in America. Um, so it was difficult for us at times, uh, but yeah. you and Raven and Sabu and RVD, you know, you were the guys in the video game, in the ECW game. Yeah. Um, yeah. And obviously, not a as you mentioned, not a high percentage of wrestlers become world champion. You know, when you look at how many wrestlers there are and how many hold that title, so that must have been yeah. an incredible, incredible time for you. It really was, and I was still in my twenties. You know, I started, at that time I was probably twenty-seven. Yeah. You know, and uh, it was it was you know I just thought, and this is a real it's a real shame about what happened, especially for a lot of guys like myself. Um, in 2001, ECW goes out of business yep. due to poor management and, um, you know, WCW, you know what happened there. So yep. all of a sudden there were three very viable, very, um, you know, big promotions. And all of a sudden, you know, there's one and I was lucky enough to get picked up, you know, by the WWE. 
lucky, yeah. you know, but that wasn't the right move for me at the time. I, I wish I, you know, because even though I went in with X-Pac, it was yep. just, you know, it was still, it was so much, I mean, you had some of the greatest talents, everybody going to WWE was so much of an influx of talent that at that time, I don't think that was the right move for me. You know what I mean? Because it was so much going on. So I just wish that, you know, that wouldn't have happened because my career really kind of ended uh, after, you know, WWE when I was 30 years old, really, because I, you know, I went to TNA and I went to Japan, but it yeah. never really quite uh, burned as bright as it did because there was no work, really. I mean, TNA was was fun and good, and I did some nice stuff there with Jerry Lynn and other guys, mm. but nothing, nothing compared to where I was. And I honestly believe um, that was because of the way the business kind of shaped itself and Vince took over everything. Yeah, yeah. it definitely was one of those worrying times, I think, even as even as a, from a fan perspective. I mean, Dave, to get, Dave sort of touched on it. In, in terms of us and ECW, so... We had um, a, ch a TV channel over in the UK called Bravo, and it, and it used mm -hmm. to be on about three o'clock in the morning, about a month behind. So we were, oh, we, are, wow. we haven't got this nowadays. And this is, brings me on to a, a nice question. Nowadays, you see things like NWA is on YouTube, and literally, I, I went on like um, I went on TikTok yesterday, and I saw a wrestling show on there. And I'm just thinking, it brings me back, is if this sort of stuff was available way back when, I don't even right. think ECW would have gone out of business in the first place. I know you said management was an issue, but if you could stream it on YouTube or go on TikTok or go Facebook Live or something like that, right. you guys would still necessarily, you guys would still be there. Well, not, I'm oh, sorry, absolutely. not necessarily now, but, you know. Oh, absolutely. No, no, I, absolutely, though. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, we were, it was, and that's the thing that was killing uh, ECW as well. Um, Paul was trying to keep guys like myself, guys like Sabu, guys like Rob Van Dam. So he was paying guys. I mean, we were making a lot of money for a small promotion. That's what I mean about, like, uh, about mismanagement. Uh, mm -hmm. It wasn't that he was, uh, you know, a lot of people complain about bounce checks. I never got I, I, I remember I had one bounce check. I got paid $3,000 a week, every week, mm -hmm. no matter how much I wrestled or didn't wrestle. And um, usually wrestled twice a week sometimes three but you know three thousand dollars a week is a pretty good amount of money more than i was making for the wwe so um you know but he was doing that with a lot of the guys he didn't want to lose and i don't think you know what i mean he was just you know and our, we had to buy our tv time after uh, we lost our tv show with uh, i think it was spike tv or yeah. whatever it was tnn that turned into spike whatever yeah. and then it just became like you know we're paying out of pocket to run in these markets uh just a lot of money going out and we you know i don't think uh, there was an it wasn't coming in fast enough not that we weren't making money it just i, I forgot the story paul tells but you know it's like literally if he could have got paid when he was supposed to from some pay-per-views that were you know because it takes months sometimes six months to get paid on the pay-per-views and if he would have just gotten one pay-per-view payment of like 50 or sixty thousand dollars you know, and he was into, you know, a couple hundred thousand with Vince and so forth. And I think also Paul was just ready to to move on. I think it was too much on him. You know what I mean? I think, you yeah. know, it, it was a lot. You know, it was a one. I mean, it, we didn't have an infrastructure. We had it was really a, a mom and pop operation. It was Dreamer handled the merchandise. You know, uh, you know, one person handled the, the, the transportation. So, you know, some people booked buildings. It was all wrestlers. And, you know, it was just uh, it was just a lot. And it was getting too big. And I think a lot of money was just being misspent. It was a shame because when we I remember our last two shows were both sellouts uh, yeah. at the Hammerstein Ballroom, you know, yeah. and, and that's in New York City. And we made a lot of money. So, you know, it, it's just a, it's just a shame because, you know, it, it could have. Uh, it could have still been going on for many years to come. When, it certainly could have been. When what? ECW did go out of business, uh, Justin, you, you'd already, you were in X Factor, yes. uh, I believe, with, with Albert and X Pac. Um, yes. Obviously, you, you did the alliance angle and you, you, you kind of combined with ECW and WCW. Um, but a couple of years later, uh, ECW, uh, ECW was kind of rebooted by the WWE. What yes. did you think of the reboot? Um, did you did you hope that you'd have a bigger part to play in it? Did you think you could perhaps get in the the title picture again, or, or what? I certainly, what I certainly thought so. I yeah. certainly thought so. And at the original one night stand, um, 
You know, yep. with the Alliance, I didn't think there was much of a chance because even Dreamer had a, a very diminished role. A lot of us guys did yep. because it was, you know, it really was still the Steve Austin show, the Kurt Angle show, mm. the Undertaker, the Rock. I mean, there, everybody was there. You know, so many people there. It was it was ridiculous. It was hard to get on TV. But uh, when we did the uh, original one night stand, you know, uh, we I was featured uh, in the opening match hitting Chris yep. Jericho. Uh, with the kendo stick, uh, allowing yes. Lance to beat him. And then we also came back out in the main event with uh, Funk and Dreamer and the Dudleys. You know, yeah, I think yeah. I hit Dreamer, Dreamer Sandman with the tombstone on the barbed wire. And, yes. you know, France, I think it was Dawn Marie got into the cat fight with Beulah. Yeah. And then, you know, we got we got kicked out of there. But, you know, we were, that was still ECW. And then when they came back in 2006 and uh, the promotion officially started again it was you know i put over cm punk which was a great start for cm punk you know it yeah. was a great match i still like looking at that match it was a nice match yeah but uh, you could just tell that at that time i was more of a utility player and they wanted to move with their own superstars which was very disappointing you know because they never they didn't know how to to do just incredible and paul Heyman did not have as much uh creative power as he, he mm. once did you know because paul would write the shows dreamer would help you know a lot of guys would help we would help ourselves you know and kind of try to help our own storylines and you know it just was never the same yeah my my kind of recollection of a fan of that period when it was rebooted a lot of you guys the, the originals were there and it did feel like something akin to how it was just with better pr production values perhaps but by the end of it it yeah. really was unrecognizable from what ECW was, in, in in my opinion. Of course, yeah. And you know why, man? ECW was perfect the way it was because we were the we were the anti WWE. We were yeah. anti establishment. Now we're part of the establishment. Yeah. I think the appeal of it all was that we were underground. And it's very hard to be underground when you're literally getting the booking starts to resemble everything else that the WWE does. It was yeah. no, nothing, nothing seemed fresh and just the way they were going about with their business. It was just, you know, you could see right through it. So I think that had a lot to do with it. Yeah. I think the biggest kick in the nuts for me, as I, as I said before, we couldn't get a lot of ECW, but we managed to get it. We could get DVDs and all of that sort of stuff. The biggest kick in the nuts for me was when Vince actually won the ECW title. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know. I mean, again, it's, I understand in, in their minds why they did it or why they would do something like that. Cause they figure, well, Vince McMahon's a proven ratings draw, you know, but I think they just used ECW as a brand, not necessarily as what it was. They just used the, they, the name and the concept in their minds was cool, but mm. uh, the, 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 what it really was and what it really stood for was not there anymore. It was they like kind of tore the heart out of it, didn't they? By the yeah, end, they, they really did. They extreme. really did. It's like it's like I can't, it's like punk rock when it first started, and then you know, listening to it, uh, you know, it's like underground, and then all of a sudden it becomes bubblegum. You know, yeah. it's uh, it's a very different thing, and that's what ECW became. It was a very different thing. Yeah. What's your, that... um, what's your opinion on AEW, Justin? Because as you say. Uh, there's, it, it was certainly a rival to WWE, and certainly to begin with, AEW seemed very different to what WWE yes. was putting out there. Um, I know Bully Ray's commented on Busted Open uh, in regards to the fan base and saying that the fan base has similarities with the ECW fan base at AEW. Would you agree with that? And what are your thoughts on AEW? I would agree. I would agree that there, you know, there certainly are uh, the hardcore fans, the a lot of them, you could say, are smart fans, whatever it is. I mean, I think most fans are smart nowadays. But, yeah, I, I think uh, when they first started, uh, I, it was very exciting. I was, I, you know, I, to this day, I mean, I still want AEW to do great. Yeah. You know, we all do. It's, it's great to have another, uh, you know, multi-million dollar company operating on uh, on television like that, you know, with live programming. Um, but, yeah, I just, uh, I, I do agree with Bully Ray. and But with AEW, I just, man, they have so many amazing talents and so many people and they just they've lost their way as well i just don't think yeah. they're the same promotion uh that started you know a couple of years ago and I, I don't expect them to be everybody changes but i feel like every week because i do a review for uh vince russo's yeah. uh brand uh, every every friday we do it uh and we review, <laughs> so do we funny enough 
<laughs> and uh, so I watch every show. I've watched every show since the inception. Uh, and I feel like I'm watching. It's it's just hard to swallow sometimes. The action at yeah. times could be so bad. And I don't understand how bad it is when they have such great talent. It's just like, no, I, I don't know. And it's just like a weird thing. I think the matches go way too long. Every match feels the same. Um, and they have so many great talents just sitting at home. I don't, I don't know what, you know, I, there's just no diversity, you know, yeah. and sometimes they put on some good, I mean, they have great matches and stuff, but what's the difference between watching a, you know, the first segment on dynamite usually goes, they give us a 15 minute match. And the, the problem with that is, um, you already know who's going over cause it'll be, it'll be, you know, uh, it'll be a mismatch in name where, you know, the other guy possibly can't go over. So you're going to basically give me. 15 minutes of action when you know, you know, John Moxley is going to go over in that. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like, can't you do that in seven and do yeah. something yet? Do some backstage stuff. Just do something a little more creative than, you know, long matches. I mean, I'd love to say, for me, I think saving longer matches is good for pay per view because what's the difference between a pay per view and a dynamite sometimes? Yeah. You know, it's like, what do you go, 25, 30 minutes? I don't think in this world of TikToks and, quick YouTube videos that a lot of people want to sit through 25 minutes or 15 minutes, even, you know, no, as compelling as some of it may be, you know, just because they're doing great spots. I mean, nobody, people rarely sell anything over there. It's just uh, it's just a mis mishmash. And it's a shame because I hear, and this disappoints me. I've never been backstage and I don't know very many of the people there, mm. but I hear that a lot of people don't even want to hear from the veterans anymore. And this build, this business was built on, yeah, you know, listening to the veterans and kind of, you know, taking the advice and, you know, do do with it what you want, but you know, you always want to listen, right? It's like if you don't want to listen to Michael Jordan, um, it's kind yeah. of silly. Even if you're a great young player coming up, you still want to listen. You might not want to, you may not do it, but you there's, you know, there's something to say for wisdom, and uh, yeah. a lot of these kids are just feeling themselves way too much, and it shows. I mean, Dynamite hasn't done a million people uh, in the U.S. in a very long time, no. and uh, it's it's gone down every every year. It's going yeah. down. It started off with a million, million point one, million point two. Mm -hmm. Now it's down regularly to seven hundred ninety to eight hundred fifty. So yeah, that's, that seems to be the ballpark of where they're at. Yeah, uh, yeah. And now with the new show coming up, it's going to be even, yes. it's going to be more interesting. So it, it, I, it, what's your thoughts on the Saturday show though? Because that's going to have a damn sight, a lot of competition over the week. I mean, I don't know what Saturday nights are like in America. It's been a while since I've been over there, but I can imagine they're going to have a lot of sports on at that time. <laughs> Uh, it depends. Uh, now, you know, Saturday nights, uh, it's more, I think more of the concern is, um, you know, people usually go out, it's, you know, Saturday nights are date yeah. nights. Uh, yeah, television, yeah. television, normally the competition isn't as great as you would think. Okay. Um, there are a lot of sports on, but, you know, mm -hmm. the sports, or, you know, the people that watch sports don't really watch wrestling. You know, there is sort of different. Um, but I think they could do it. I would like, what I personally would like to see is, you uh, I don't know what the time is that the the timetable like what time they're going to go on, but I would love for them to do like the old WCW six to eight because that was just a great time because you know if people go out, people are going out around eight o'clock, you know especially oh. you know people that watch wrestling, the younger generation and stuff like that. So that traditional six o'clock that you know it was like six o five to eight o five on TBS, you oh. know, and uh, yeah. it was, it always worked for them. So I would love to see that. And I would love to see it be more like that, not necessarily a Nitro-esque, Raw-esque show, just more of, um, you know, show us the characters. So almost like a studio show I would love to see. Sure. You know, I don't know if that would work these days, but it could, you know, almost like an old NWA show. You well, know, I was going to say, I watch, N I watch NWA on YouTube uh, on a Tuesday night over here about 11 p.m. And it's like a, it, it's the old school NWA setup. You know, you've got like this yeah. an intimate arena. You've got like a, a little stage where they do their interviews. And they've got some great talent on there as well. Um, I think sure. Collision is going to be on at 8 o'clock Eastern, I believe. Is that what it is? I think so. Yeah. yeah and just go and right touch upon, Justin, what you said earlier. You mentioned about um, obviously the, the AEW guys not um, – wanting to listen to veterans and stuff like that. I think that, that that's what kind of started something along with what was going on with punk. But um, my question was, because if I started, if, if, say for example, I was, I wish I was, I wish I had the millions and millions and millions of pounds or dollars that you need to start a, a, a federation, a wrestling federation up. Um, I would be looking at like, 
people like yourselves and Shane Douglas and like a Kevin Nash to like help me backstage with production and to get into your minds and to understand and to help the talent. I mean, f for me, you you and Shane Douglas would be like, you, Shane Douglas and Raven, for argument's sake, would be one of my top threes to to sit out the back and, and help the younger guys and help write the show. I'm really surprised that they haven't thought about reaching out to people like yourselves. And I don't know if they have to Shane Douglas, to be honest, but... Uh, I don't think they have to any of us. I, I don't, I, and I don't, I don't know why. I honestly don't. Maybe with Kevin, maybe with Kevin, they might not, you know, because of how he was with politics in WCW. Maybe they would, they wouldn't want somebody like that around. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. But I would think, I would think Kevin would be great for something like. How could he not be? You know, how yeah. could even even guys like, um, you know, like a Shane Douglas? I mean, he is, he's, he's so amazing. He's so he smart. Is. I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, uh, I would love a, a crack at it, you know? I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I'm i one of the few people, if you think about it, that is still active right now, although mm -hmm. I don't wrestle very much. But I am still active. I mean, I, I started out in 92. I mean, I, yeah. I've, got, I've got 30 years pretty much, 31 years, you know, mm -hmm. in the business. It, we can't help, and we've been everywhere, you know? I don't know who could. Um, I, they just are, they show no interest, you know, and I think they kind of keep that little club to themselves, you know, they're, yeah. they remind me very much of a huge indie fed, you know, and they kind of book it that way. Yeah. You, you kind of, I'm not trying to get you to name names, Justin, but obviously there's, oh, I don't there's mind a, naming names. well, there was, <laughs> you got like Kenny Omega, the young bucks, hangman, the elite, and they were there, you know, from the inception and you've got guys like Danielson and Moxley and people like that that have come over from the WWE. And you would automatically think that they would be on the same page and they would all want the right thing. And they would, they would be talking to the younger wrestlers as you know, and passing that knowledge on. So do you think that's the divide? Is there a kind of, I, 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 see indie divide? That, I think so. Um, I, I, I look, I know Brian Danielson very well. Um, I mean, you know, he was one of the biggest stars on the planet just a couple of years ago. And they, they've done a horrible job with him. Um, and at least in, in not to have him, you know, in some way pick, the, you know, pick these guys' brains. I just would imagine that everybody would have come together uh, a lot easier. I think there's so much ego involved, which I, I, it blows my mind because ECW, the way it worked was there was no, there was barely any ego. Nobody cared about wins and losses, man. Nobody, we all knew that it was for the betterment of the company. And we would all get get our wins back and Paul would make us look good because Paul needed all of us to look good, you know, and that could still be done. And that's something I don't see over there. I just see people very much. Um, I don't know why, but very selfish. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And, and it's you. And it's in the way I hear it again, I've never been a step foot in a locker. It's just things you hear is that it's the younger generation. That's a bit selfish, you know, and doesn't want anything to do with the veterans. You, 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 a lot of them don't even want to work with the veterans. Like you got Billy Gunn, one of the greats, you know, yep. who's done it all, you know, part of DX, done other, a million other things, mm. you know, and I hear they don't want to mess with, you know what I mean? He's got a great gimmick. He's, you know, looks fantastic still, you know, yeah, doing what he's he doing, but like, you know, just as a backstage personality, he would do fantastic. You know, he and, but I, I heard, I heard from, I heard that like, they don't want to hear like from Jerry Lynn or Dean Malenko who were there. They don't want to hear about it from anybody. They're just, a lot of people just shut it down, That's which is wild. Crazy. Which is wild, yeah. yeah. You know, because one thing you couldn't do that in WWE. You know, there was a there was yeah. a pecking order, and you had to really respect. Every there was a huge amount of respect in the WWE. You know, and I just feel like the respect in AEW, it's like the Wild West, but not in a good way. Yeah, so I mean, I heard that Danielson might be doing some creative collision. I think that's what I heard. Uh, that's what it was. We've been reported anyway. We take reports with a grain of salt, uh, as, as as we always do. But uh, sure. it does feel, you know, it does feel that way. As you say, I lo I've loved it at the start. Um, I still like it today to, to a degree, but I have issues with it. I, my biggest issue at the minute is is the booking of the champions. I'm always I'm a bit an old school guy when it comes to wrestling. I always like my champions to have. Uh, Longish reigns. I mean, obviously Roman Reigns is is a bit long, but it's been it's been booked well enough to not bore me. Anyway, uh, sure. I don't know. I'm, I'm not. Listen, I'm, I'm by no means a wrestling guru. I wouldn't. You know, I'm, I'm not as mindful as you guys. I know what I like. And my thing right. about it at the moment is, uh, like, for example, you you've watched this stuff. I mean, Orange Cassidy uh, has held uh, the, uh, the international title for ages, but he's never had a feud. 
it's been right. like I, I said it today it's like if you've been to the arcades and you've spun the wheel on whatever number you land on the number of tickets that you win that's kind of why i see how he's booking this he's spinning the wheel and oh this week it's the pentaco so he's going to go against orange cassidy for the for the uh for the title but i'm always the thing about you know making the titles mean something i know it's an old cliche nowadays and it's probably not as well received as what it should be but that's just why i'm like I, I like to have my champions really book strong and long uh, long reigns basically <clears throat> yeah I, I agree i agree too i mean i think uh title titles should mean something i mean that's that, look, that's the that's the reason that wrestlers do what they do right it's supposed to be you know you're supposed to be fighting for the championship and we you know we we heard from in the beginning that tony khan wanted wins and losses to mean something and that yeah. you know, at one point they would put up you know 15 yeah. wins three losses whatever um but they could have done they could have even done something like a pro wrestling illustrated with back in the day like the top 10 with the yeah. champion up top and then like try to do it that way you could have somebody like you know backstage person doing like a, you know a weekly thing like well this you know the, the, you know, it might be, you know, who's moving up, who's moving, you know, it's almost like a sports thing, a sports show, yeah. not a sports show, but like a segment for a couple of minutes, you know what I mean? Just kind of like mm -hmm. who's in the hunt, you know, if there's no feuds happening or whatever, it just there's so many creative ways you could really do it and uh, make it mean something, you know, it's not that, wrestling isn't that hard. That's the thing, <laughs> I think we make it a lot harder than it should be. You know what I mean? Seriously. Yeah. yeah. You know, it yeah. shouldn't be that hard. And, and, I, and I really haven't, um, like I am surprised nobody has done a storyline like a Raven and a Dreamer. Remember that storyline? Yeah. Where they oh, were like, you know yeah. what I mean? It took it took that took forever, but yeah. Yeah, the payoff was great, and Dreamer finally did it. You know that kind of we haven't seen an epic storyline like that really yet. And you know what you I know, liked about that is that it's it kind of stopped and segued into other areas, then come back again. Yes. So it kind of took you away from that feud and then grabbed you back back into it about six months late when you think like, oh you bastard right <laughs> you know yes. what i mean like, yes <laughs> yes and then you know i'm surprised they haven't done something like that you know there's no. so many things you can do uh and, and it's just you know uh hindsight 2020 of course but you just it's a shame that they're just not yeah you know i think it's too much on tony khan too i don't know exactly mm. who writes what but i mean he's writing a lot of television man he especially is. now he also does ring of honor yeah, and he, and he runs a football club over there too. He, he runs a soccer club in England. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying. Fulham, See, yeah. I called it football. You called it soccer. Well, there you <laughs> that's go. what I meant. I meant you guys. <laughs> I'm so used See, to. I, I wasn't even thinking of the Jaguars over here, but yeah, no, I was talking about no. you guys over there. But yeah, yeah, he's got a lot on his plate, so I just don't see how. I think he needs help, man. I think he needs he does. help. But again, I, the way I would say about needing help is I wouldn't say choose like the WWE would, would bring in somebody that's, re, that's wrote 21 seasons of Law and Order for argument's sake, whereas I would bring in wrestlers. Yes. Because yeah, who better to write the product than the people that have been in the product, right? 100%. 100%. And I, I would love to know who's in the production meetings in AEW. I really would. I would like, you know, and, there, and one thing I don't understand is this CM Punk is um, obviously a big star, whatever. And yeah. uh, I like, I like CM Punk. I never had any mm -hmm. problems with CM Punk, just to say that. But yeah. like, you know, we're sitting here worried about if Ace Steel is going to get a job. Who the hell is Ace Steel? He's never been anywhere, dude. And you're worried about him being like some kind of creative person. Like, you know what I mean? I know it's his buddy yeah. and that's why he's there, but it's just madness that this is even being talked about. Like yeah. there's just it's like it's yeah. like really, yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's it, know. it's interesting because I, I look at it and I see all these legends backstage at AEW. So they've they've got the personnel, they've got the you know the Dean Malenko's, the Jerry Lynn's, the Mark Henry's, the Daniel. Big Show. They've got these guys that have done it all. Uh, maybe they need more responsibility. Maybe it's down to Tony Cotton. Maybe, maybe they're I, like they've got their hands tied. I think they do. I really think they do. I don't think they're given an option. Yeah. I think they're. I think everybody is. I, and this is the feeling I get, and I've not heard this from anyone, by anybody, but I just feel like people are getting paid good, right? Maybe too good, and they're just like, "Fuck this!" You know, let me just yeah. let me just do the bare minimum what I'm asked. Let's ride this train till it till the wheels fall off. You know, make our money and go home. You know. Anyway, anyway. Yeah, may well be. Justin, we've got to start wrapping up tonight. It has been fantastic okay. talking to you. Um, can you just tell them everyone, you've mentioned it before, you're on with Russo. When, how can they watch it and how can they reach you on socials? 
Um, sure. Just uh, I don't have much going on right now, but just follow me both on Twitter and on Instagram at PJ Polacco. And if you want any one of my many wrestling T-shirts, go on over to ProWrestlingTees.com backslash Just Incredible. And that's uh, pretty much it. Great. Well, guys, I need to I need to quickly go through bits that we've got coming on. We're on with EC3 in about half an hour uh, by the sounds of it. Um, we've got an event coming up. So we sponsor British wrestling over here in the UK. We're big advocates of British wrestling and we sponsor uh, Ignite Wrestle Pro over here in the UK. And we've actually collaborated for an independent show that's coming up on the 23rd of July, uh, which is called Buckle Up. Um, we've got some great talent going on there. We have sold out of fronts. Second is limited. Uh, so get down to Boreham Wood in England if you get an opportunity. Uh, shout outs to the guys at Pro Wrestling Carnage in Wales. It's another pro wrestling company that we sponsor, as well as the tag team, which I wish he could have come on today to speak with you, Justin. We have a tag team over there called Beers and Beatdowns. I think they're the best tag team in the world with that name, anyway. Oh, wow. Um, right on. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> Well, great guys. Yeah, they, uh, they those guys are great. We sponsor them as well. Uh, we sponsor British independent wrestler Corey McRae, who's off, I think, to Poland and Germany in the coming weeks. Uh, I'm going to Jurassic Pro Wrestling over in Harwich in a couple of weeks to watch their show. Uh, we've got some other guests coming on tomorrow. Dave, who have we got tomorrow? Because then you flexed your booking muscles. Uh, we've got um, Millie McKenzie coming on, who was, uh, she was in the WWE. She was in uh, NXT UK. Uh, and there she's making a splash on the indie scene in the UK. So it'd be great to hear it from Millie. And you shared some nachos with her at WrestleMania once, right? I did, yeah. I did. True story. <laughs> yeah, pre-WrestleMania. Yeah, excellent. Guys, uh, Justin, again, thanks so much for your time. Dave, I will see you very soon. Guys, this has been the Hitting the Turnbuckle podcast. I've been your host, Adam Cousins, and we'll be back very soon. Good night. <laughs>